Hey guys, this is Miss Sinclair for AP World History at University High School. Today we are continuing on with our Unit 7 lecture notes. This time we are talking about nationalism in Japan, Germany, and Italy. So let's get started. Today we are looking at the uh, topic 7.1 of the AP curriculum, I would like you to be able to explain the cause and consequences of the unification of two of the following, Japan, Germany, or Italy. So I want you to be able to compare them, to think about causation, which is an important skill, but we are just continuing on. So during this time period, we see that nationalism in Europe is just huge. It, this is a really unique time in European history and world history in general because you're having the emergence of this sort of national identity. For most of world history, people didn't think of themselves as Chinese, Japanese, French, British. They thought of themselves primarily of members of their local ethnic group. I am primarily Kurdish. I am primarily Han Chinese or Manchu. I am primarily a Gaul, Scottish, English from Prussia or Bohemia. So one thing we will see emerging in the 19th century is this new shared political identity that will be held more tightly than your local ethnic identity. And there's nothing about this that is to be expected. This is a unique thing that is emerging. We have had a sense of political identities before in world history, right? To be a Roman citizen was a big deal. But this sort of national identity um, is very unique because even if you were a Roman citizen, you would be Germanic or from Spain, a Gaul, all of that would still matter. So let's define a couple terms here. Nationalism is a political ideology that stresses people's membership in a nation, a community defined by common culture and history, as well as territory. So a nation is not necessarily the same thing as a sovereign state. For example, the United States wouldn't typically be considered a nation because of our variety of ethnic backgrounds, languages, religious views, whereas Iceland or Japan could very easily be defined as nation states because the people within them are generally the same ethnic group, speak the same language, have the same background, much more of that common culture and history. So language was really a key way of creating a feeling of unity, as well as this sense of self-defining by pointing out what we are not. There, um, there's a specific term for this that I can't remember. A really good resource on this entire concept is the Crash Course European History video recently posted that looks at the unification of Germany and Italy. So Italy and Germany, for most of our history so far, haven't been single unified states. They've been lots of small states within it. You have Bohemia and Prussia. You have Naples and Milan, lots of city-states in Italy. And in Central and Eastern Europe, we will see nationalism breaking large states into smaller ones as we see the breakdown of the Austro-Hungarian Empire or the Ottoman Empire as different parts of the Balkans desire self-governance. They say, you know, in Serbia, we are Serbs. This is who we are. We are not like you, Ottomans. We want to be our own state. So you see that self-determination. So nationalism in the 19th century will be uniting some regions, acting as a centripetal force, but in other regions it will cause breakdown. It will act as a centrifugal force. So nationalism is often associated with liberalism. 
this revolutionary middle-class ideology that asserts sovereignty of the people, demanded constitutional government, a national parliament, and freedom of expression. So in 1848, all of those European revolutions that we saw really demonstrate to conservatives that they can't suppress liberalism. So it is better to use mass politics to preserve the status quo. They realize that you can't just go back to old-fashioned Louis XIV absolutism. The cat's out of the bag on that one. And as we have more information infrastructure in place, newspapers are more widely available, more people can read them, the desire to have your voice heard isn't going to go away either. So we start to see conservatives utilizing mass media and these sort of political movements, constitutional monarchies, to embed their values as well. Let's start talking about Italy, though. So the univer uh, unification of Italy. Italy was, at this point, divided into nine separate states, and there was a lot of barriers to unification. For one thing, Italy wasn't very industrialized. You're going to see a lot of the Mediterranean at this point is not really industrialized. Even today, the Mediterranean is significantly more agricultural than Northern Europe. This is for a few reasons. One, natural resources. The growing season in the Mediterranean is longer. They can grow more food. It's much more successful. They don't have that same need to create an industrial economy. Second, they don't have as many of the same resources for an industrial economy. So because of that, you don't have quite the same large industrial cities in Italy that you have in England with London or Birmingham. You also see that along with that, since you don't have a single unified ideology and political movement, you don't have the same sort of education. So illiteracy is a huge issue in Italy. And so that means you're not going to be able to build support through newspapers, right? Think about the importance that newspapers and journals have played, pamphlets have played in the American Revolution with common sense, the French Revolution, the revolutions of 1848, even just the emergence of socialist and Marxist movements. But in Italy, you don't have that because most people can't read. You have the Pope as well. This is an interesting political and religious factor that everyone else doesn't have to worry about. Remember, most of our Northern European states are Protestant. So they said, whatever, Pope, like we're going to do what we want. We don't have to listen to you. Whereas Italy is still primarily Catholic, still is today. So that means since the Pope is God's voice here on earth, it's the highest earthly authority you have, if the Pope says, oh no, unification is a sin, well then that would be a huge problem. So how do you deal with the Pope? How do you appease him? Make sure that the Pope doesn't feel like he is losing all of his power, but also um, not try and live in the past. You have a lack of consensus within the Italian peninsula of what kind of state do we want to create? And you have a lack of external European support as well. So I want you to take a moment to look at this map I have here. You see that you have multiple sort of Italian states. You have the Kingdom of Sardinia. The island of Corsica there is actually owned by France. You have the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, our papal states, Lombardy, Tuscany. So one of the things that we will see is that it's external intervention that has to do with some of this. So for example, Napoleon's nephew, gosh, I can't remember his name, um, the emperor of France, not Napoleon Bonaparte, but the second one, he is going to sort of intervene in Italy, trying to gain more territory for himself in um, Nice and Savoy in that region of Piedmont and they want Italy to unify so then they can just have that section of it. 
So there are lots of factors, though, supporting unification. Geography, I mean, it makes sense. They're a big peninsula. It makes sense that they would be a single state. Pride in your shared heritage, the shared history of like, we were Rome. We have been unified before. We can do it again. We have a long history. Europe is all about classical history at this time. The best of the best in universities were studying Greek and Roman history. They weren't studying sciences. That wasn't the elite. But instead, it was really all about the humanities. And Italy's the birth of that. Italy's the birth of the Renaissance. Italy is the birth of so many art movements and significant political movements. And then you just have a shared pride in Italian culture. So you have Count Camillo di Cavori, who will start to lead a nationalist movement. And he will uh, help create a parliamentary monarchy under King Victor Emmanuel II. So the problems are, in from the get-go, the right to vote suffrage is really limited to upper and middle class property holders. So you don't have universal suffrage. The um, poor people are not gonna have the vote. Women certainly aren't gonna have the vote. You are also going to see that there are disagreements over imperialism. Right? The rest of Europe is on this huge imperialist fad, and they are going all around in Africa and in Asia, taking con- uh, territory for themselves. Well, Italy is like, well, should we do that? I mean, we don't want to fall behind. And some people say like, no, like we have what we need. We don't want to overstretch ourselves. And other people feel that pressure. And then finally, economically, they lack industry, right? They don't have an industrial economy, so they are not on the same level as Germany, France, Denmark, and in particular, England. And they lack natural resources that would assist in that sort of industrial innovation. All right. There's a lot you could go into here. If you're taking AP Euro, you can get into so much detail. But for our purposes and for world history, essentially you need to know that it happened and generally how this trend of nationalism is manifesting itself in Europe. But we should also talk about the unification of Germany. So this is much more significant than that of Italy. So if you remember back in the day, we had the Holy Roman Empire, like think Habsburgs, right? And it was really dissolved in 1806 when Napoleon conquered all of Europe. After the Congress of Vienna, the German Confederation of 39 territories was created. So you have lots of small territories. We talk about like German princes. And so this starts to create feelings of German nationalism. The largest most powerful and most significant of these German states is going to be Prussia. So Prussia is over in eastern Germany, and it is going to be the most industrialized out of our German states. They have newly industrialized or new industries in the Rhineland, and they are going to be the first European army to really make use of railroads, telegraphs, and modern weapons. So what are some of the barriers that we see to German unification? One, the rest of Europe doesn't want Germany unified, right? It is in everyone else's best interests to keep Germany weak and splintered. So you will see lots of outside intervention of politics, of lies in the media, anything to try and build up this sort of tension between German states because it keeps them weaker, right? Everyone's acting in their own self-interest here. Two, we see still tensions in this region between Protestants and Catholics. Remember, it frankly wasn't that long ago that we had the 30 years war, that 30 years of violence between German princes who supported the Pope and those who wanted to follow Lutheranism. And the 
last thing is the fact that Prussia would be the most powerful state in this new unified Germany. So if you're Bavaria or Bohemia or Saxony or Hanover, you don't necessarily want that. I mean, right now you can do your own thing, but in a unified Germany, well, would you still have that voice in your own governance or would it really just be like being conquered by Prussia? We do have some support for unification. There's this common culture, shared languages, intellectual support from philosophers and authors. And then there's Otto von Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck is the guy to know in association with German unification. He begins as, frankly, someone not very impressive. He was a party boy. He never really was very motivated or ambitious. And then he gets married and his wife is like, get your act together. Uh, and she's kind of the driving force to encourage him to be like, okay, yeah, I guess I need to like be an adult. And so he starts getting involved in politics and ends up becoming the prime minister of Prussia between 1862 and 1861 where he will eventually become the chancellor of United Germany. So he's a conservative nationalist and creator of the German Empire. So there's a couple ways he does this that's pretty clever. One, to get the area of... Gosh, my German, I'm sorry guys, is terrible. It's like Schlesting-Holstein... It's that area right here, just south of Denmark. So he convinces Austria-Hungary to fight with him against Denmark to divide up this land and, you know, because the Danes suck. Then he will go to war with Austria and claim all that war, um, all that land himself. Then he goes to war with France in the Franco-Prussian War. This is a significant war because it's kind of a precursor to a lot of the fighting that we see with the world wars. So the Franco-Prussian War between 1870 and 1871, we are going to see that the French lose. So one of the things that Germany and Bismarck was doing. So Bismarck was working primarily under Wilhelm I, William I. And he is going to bring in outside experts to build up and train the Prussian army. So the Prussian army at this time is the best army in the world. They are highly trained. They have the most effective weapons. They are able to use the industrial infrastructure. Whereas the French army's still very old-fashioned, and it's kind of embarrassing. So the Prussians easily win against the French. And so this will lead to the Treaty of Frankfurt, which will lead to the French giving up the territory of All Saints Lorraine. So that's right here. So out of this, you will also see the emergence of our unified Germany in 1871. So under Wilhelm I, king of Prussia, you will now have a united Germany and Wilhelm is now the German emperor and Otto von Bismarck is going to be the first chancellor, kind of like prime minister of Germany. So this is a pretty good video on Otto von Bismarck, I really do recommend that you watch the Crash Course European History on this as well to just clarify it for you if you have any questions. As we go forward in German history, we are going to see that the First Reich is going to be this German Empire from 1871 to 1918, and then you'll have the Second Reich, which is the Wehrmeer Republic it's in the they're going to govern during the interwar period, which is why Nazi Germany under Adolf Hitler is known as the Third Reich. So define irredentism. This should be a word that you learned last year in AP Human Geography. 
and how does nationalism contribute to the unification of Germany and Italy? Use this as a check for your own understanding. And think about how does the definition of irredentism impact what we just learned about. But let's talk about Japan. So when we left Japan, you were just starting to learn about how it was beginning to industrialize. But let's do a quick recap on the Tokugawa shogunate. So the Tokugawa shogunate will emerge after the Genpai Wars, where you had a lot of violence and strife in Japan. When you get Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and eventually Tokugawa Iwayasu taking charge and establishing the Tokugawa shogunate, they are able to establish a much more stable Japan with less fighting, a much more centralized government. And this is also the time when they exclude Europeans from their islands. So we've talked about how they persecuted Christians, how they limited European contact to only the Dutch were allowed to do trade is, uh, with Japan on the island of Deshima and Tokyo Bay. Well, now we see that things are in decline. So during the first half of the 19th century, the shogunate continued to combine central bureaucracy with semi-feudal alliances. And the policy of alternative attendance continues to keep the daimyos under the control of the shogun. So remember, the policy of alternative attendance meant that the daimyos had to spend one year in Tokyo, and then they could spend the next year at home in their own territory. This keeps them poor because they have to keep up two households. It also keeps them from being able to build up support in their own land and become a threat. However, we're seeing that the shogunate is beginning to run into financial problems. Taxes were based primarily on agriculture and land, despite the growing commercialization of Japan. So that means less land is being cultivated, which means less taxes. We see that Japan is gradually becoming more secular. Schools and academies are expanding. You see the growth of Dutch studies programs. Confucianism is still being taught, but interest in westernization is slowly growing. Next, commerce and manufacturing are expanding slowly, but in general, the shogunate is technologically behind the West, and Japan is not industrialized. But let's be clear, even though officially the only people you have contact with is going to be the Dutch on the island of Deshima, we have lots of illegal contact with foreigners. We have this massive black market. So it's not like Japan was living in a bubble while the rest of the world industrialized. But formally, the government was choosing to turn a blind eye to all of that and remain isolated. That ends in 1853, when American Commodore Matthew Perry rolls up in Tokyo Bay with his steamboat and his guns and basically says, let us do business with you or I'll shoot. <laughs> and Japan's like, okay, I guess we don't really have a choice here. So he is going to be the first foreigner to break through Japan's official isolation. And he does it through force. I really like this picture. It depicts the American steamship. I like all the angry faces and how sinister it looks. But we see that this is going to change how Japan is looking at things. So in 1856, Japan's going to open up two ports to Americans, British, Dutch, and Russians. Um, I, they each get like two ports. The shogunate starts to see that they don't have an alternative but to open Japan to the outside world, given the West's power. So think about it. In the 17th century, when they were worried about the Jesuits coming in and teaching Japanese citizens about Catholicism, you have as your biggest threat the Portuguese acting like pirates in the Indian Ocean. Right? Not a huge threat. Now, all of a sudden, in the following two centuries, Europe has conquered so much of Asia, 
India, Africa, they have these steamships with um, dreadnoughts, so these massive metal boats that can shoot cannons from the top of them. Like this is a very different world. They can't just ignore the West. And if you remember, part of their isolation from the get-go was a reaction to European imperialism and a desire to avoid that. Now they realize we need to do more than just avoid it. We need to leverage this knowledge that they have so we can protect ourselves. So, hence the Boshin War. This is a civil war inside Japan, and it involves the emperor and the imperial samurai versus the shogunate. So, one thing for you to know and remember is that while we've been talking about the sh different shogunates, Kamakura, Ashikaga, Tokugawa, all this time, Japan has still had an emperor who's living the good life, even though the emperor has had little to no influence in actual governance. Well, at this point, the emperor desires Japan to industrialize, and the shogunate wants to stick with tradition. This is a continuity we see throughout world history. Those who are already in power tend to be very conservative because they view any change as a potential threat to their power and um, situation. And they're usually right. So you have this war that ends with the abdication of the Tokugawa shogunate. The samurai are interested in westernization, and they think that Japan needs to control its own economic affairs. The situation right now means that isolation doesn't mean you're in control. It means you're just kind of reacting. So Emperor Meiji is going to now be the main ruler of Japan instead of establishing a new shogunate. And we call this the Meiji Restoration. If you've ever seen the movie Last Samurai with Tom Cruise, this is about the Boshin War. And one of the problems that we will see is that the shogun's troops are using swords and arrows, and the emperor's troops are using guns and cannons. So it's not really a fair fight in the end, but it's a good movie. So let's talk about the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration is a political program that followed the destruction of the Tokugawa shogunate in which a collection of young leaders set Japan on the path to centralization, industrialization, and imperialism. So we see that Emperor Meiji is restored as imperial ruler. And in 1871, the Meiji government will end feudalism by replacing daimyos with prefects. So you no longer have this system of governance that have been in place in Japan since the medieval period, right? It's uh, We see that J Japanese feudalism is similar structurally to European feudalism. Now, instead of having a daimyo or a lord rule an area, you have a prefect who's appointed by the government. It's n The prefect's son will not inherit the title like from his father like a daimyo might. This centralizes the government and it means that these new people in leadership are primarily loyal to the emperor, right? They get their position and power from the government, not from birth. We also start to see the establishment of heavy industry. Lots of these daimyos had had illegal contact with the outside world and had started industrializing on their own. So it's not like we are viewing Japan as technologically at the same level as they were in 1600, but they haven't been seeking industrialization in any sort of organized way. Emperor Meiji is going to look at Europe 
and copy what he sees are the best systems. He's going to send samurai to Europe to learn from these systems. He's going to import military leaders to train up his own troops. So he will copy Imperial Germany for the government, the British Navy, and Prussia for the army. Samurai were sent to Western Europe and the United States to study Western economic, political theory, new forms of technology. This serves several purposes. One, you're going to get well-trained people. Two, it gets the samurai out of Japan, which removes a potential threat. So, In 1873, we have the establishment of the conscription law, which means every able-bodied male Japanese citizen, regardless of class, must serve five years in the military. This is disliked by both peasants and the samurai. The samurai are resentful of this new Western-style military, and the law effectively abolishes the samurai class. We also see in the 1880s the establishment of a bicameral parliament called the Diet. It's D-I-E-T. So the bureaucracy is reorganized. We have a civil service exam. Parliament advises the government but does not control it. So I hope you're seeing here how rapidly Japan is changing itself, right? We are going from a feudal system with samurai and katanas to within 20 years, we now have a bicameral legislature and a Western-style military. Japan sees what's available to them, and they say, like, yep, we're doing it. Their goal here is to prepare for any Western invasion, right? Britain has conquered India. The Opium Wars said, show that almighty China cannot prevent the West. And so Japan realizes, look, if we want a chance of survival, we need to step it up. So they do all of this to empower themselves and so they can continue to govern themselves. So the Meiji government funds rapid industrialization. They establish the Ministry of the Interior, which supervised all economic policy The strong government support enabled successful industrialization. We have the establishment of national banks, technological training. The military is westernized. You have the buildup of railroads, factories, steamships, telegraph lines and postal services, clocks and calendars. Think about all the changes that industrialization wrought to the Western world. Japan came to it late, but they were able to enact all those changes so fast. They are going to send hundreds of students to Britain, Germany, and the United States, and they will begin increasing their trade of manufactured goods. The problems with all this is Japan's still an island, right? This has always meant that they are resource poor, particularly in the kinds of resources that you need to industrialize, iron and coal. So this means they are still dependent on the West for these goods because European powers are our main economic forces doing long-distance trade, especially with China being so pathetic now. And we see that while the Meiji government funded all of that industry, they require high taxes to pay for it all. So something to keep in mind as we see this One of the reasons why Japan will start to look at expanding their reach, conquering Korea, Manchuria, Southeast Asia in the early 20th century is because they have this need for resources. So westernization in Meiji Japan. The Meiji government will introduce things like public primary education where science, Western ideas of Mathematics and science will be taught, but so will Japanese values. We see this leads to a population boom, in part thanks to improvements in medical care and nutrition, so the crude death rate goes down. We see that Western-style clothing, hairstyles, and art styles are all adopted. And we see a lot of dispute between generations. The older generations in Japan are clinging to tradition, whereas the young are very interested in the West. 
Yet, let's be clear, the Japanese family remains very traditional, right? So that Confucian filial piety, very patriarchal. National loyalty and devotion to the emperor is encouraged. So we see that Japan, unlike many other parts of the world, industrializes without any real revolution, without riots in the streets or bombs like we see in the rest of Europe. They are able to do this rapidly and with the full support, for the most part, of their population. So who was Matthew Perry and what did he do? What was the Boshan War? And describe the Meiji Restoration. What were some changes made during this period? This is another crash course that I recommend. This is just crash course world history. It's the one on nationalism. It will give you more of a world orientation for all of this. Okay, so how much more do we want to talk about today? Let's talk about a little bit more today. Let's talk about nationalism and social Darwinism. So we see that Western influence and power is on the rise around the world. This means that the industrial revolution is creating a need for new markets and a need for new raw materials. So these new European colonies meet those needs. Two, we see the industrialization of the West's military, the emergence of the repeating rifle and the machine gun. This will really enable the spread of Western empires. Three, we see steamships enabling massive European emigration. So remember, emigration means they're exiting, they're leaving. So many societies begin to have immigrant majorities. So we see Germans, Italians, Greeks, Hungarians, Jews, Poles, the Irish. We see the Irish potato famine during this time, Chinese. So all of these groups will face various levels of discrimination. Think about the Chinese Exclusion Act in the United States, the white Australia policy, and all of these groups will bring their cultures with them and create ethnic enclaves. So a couple things to think about. All those groups I just mentioned were migrating to the United States, but also you have a huge influx of Italians to Argentina, these groups going to South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. Then, of course, you have immigration within Europe, right? People are migrating between European countries. And on top of that all, you have massive rural to urban migration as well. We see public opinion becomes important in a way that never has in world history. This is because of the parliamentary system. Politicians have to appeal to the citizen to get their support. And newspapers and more education mean that there are more ways for these politicians to reach the public. Yet let's be clear here. With all of this information, not all of it's good or reliable. We start to see politicians and journalists begin to appeal to emotion and sensation to get support. So the kind of yellow journalism that we see today where it's all about sex scandals and people aren't checking their facts before they're publishing it. That's a massive problem here as well. Last, social Darwinism. We've talked about this before. It's going to be used to justify European conquest over non-European societies. It values the powerful over the weak in every relation. So remember, social Darwinism is all about survival of the fittest within society, which means if you're in power, you deserve to be there. So that means men deserve to be in power more over women, right? The rich deserve their wealth and position more than the poor. Europeans are better than everyone else because if they weren't, then Europe wouldn't be the most powerful country regions in the world, right? If Europe wasn't everything that they thought themselves to be, then they wouldn't be able to conquer everyone, right? They, their own success confirms their own beliefs. Humans are, 
have power over nature. This will impact how we treat the, our natural resources, especially as we increase mining and deforestation. So Europeans will really keep to themselves in the colonies and prefer not to mix with natives. And there are going to be laws in place to keep these relationships at a minimum, right? They don't want <laughs> they don't want to view the native peoples as equals, right? If you get to know them, you're going to realize, hey, even though this person has a different color skin than I do, they are just as smart and val um, deserving of respect as I am. They don't want that, right? It's all about keeping those in power in power. So racial, white racial supremacy is going to be widely accepted. And there are going to be pseudoscientific theories used to justify mental and moral superiority of whites over the rest of mankind based on skin color. So that means there's no reason to socialize or adopt non-European cultures. So social Darwinism and international power politics will govern international relations. This is one of the things that will make the modernist movements in music, art, and literature so groundbreaking. One of the things that all of these modernist movements will do is they'll start to utilize some of the artistic methods that they see used in the colonies. So for example, there's going to be a modern art movement called primitiv primitivism. And it is going to be practiced by Picasso and a few others. And they are going to look at African tribal masks and look at the exaggeration of features in there and begin to move away from pretty realistic, romantic, artistic styles to mimic that more. Now, A, how do I rebel against the status quo, right? Well, if the status quo is all about Europe is the best, well, let's start reaching for those other ideologies and artistic modes that Europe isn't valuing. B, you can still see their own bias, right? The fact that it's called primitivism, right? They're viewing that this art style that they're mimicking, these, Euro these European men are copying a centuries-long artistic style from Africa, and they're saying it's primitive instead of it's a sophisticated art form in itself. So who's in power at Europe at this time? Well, after the death of Wilhelm I, we see Germany is still super in power. Otto von Bismarck has no desire to expand. He creates high tariffs to protect German industry and agriculture. He is a conservative, right? So he's going to do things to keep the socialist party out of positions of power, but he will also create social legislation, medical and unemployment insurance, disability and old age pensions. He will propose public education. Things shift in Germany though, when we have the death of Wilhelm I to Wilhelm II. Wilhelm II doesn't like Bismarck. He thinks he's old-fashioned. He wants to be like the rest of Europe, expanding, being stronger, more militaristic, just more of everything. So he ditches Otto von Bismarck as chancellor and surrounds himself with yes-men, people who just agree with him. But because of that, he is incredibly insecure and wants to make sure he's popular. So he's going to look to the newspapers to see how his policies are being received. And that's not exactly an accurate mirror. He wants a global policy and a colonial empire. So Wilhelm II is ambitious. He's aggressive. We are also going to see that the liberal powers in Europe are going to be France and Great Britain. And I say liberal in a very loose sense, right? It's not liberal the way we think of it today. So France is no longer the most powerful state in continental Europe. Germany is. France has a smaller population. It lacks that cohesive sense of self. Think about all the different French republics and empires that have been in place since that first French Revolution. Britain, on the other hand, 
has had many smooth transitions of power in parliament. Political parties have gained power and lost power. But Britain right now is struggling with their first colony, which is Ireland. Right, You have the Irish potato famine. You have strong nationalist movements in Ireland. And economically, Britain is starting to fall behind the United States and Germany. Queen Victoria, though, is still reigning supreme. Also, like, she had a million kids, and, like, all of her kids are in all the other royal families. So, what about our conservative powers of Europe? Russia and Austria-Hungary. Man, Russia is still such a backwards place. So, if you remember, you had, in 1861, Alexander II, Tsar Alexander II, eliminating serfdom. But it's... Great, like you have a new title, but he doesn't allow for any huge change, right? So the serfs are this huge population of unskilled, uneducated peasants. We see that the diffusion of the potato has allowed for this population to grow. But for much of European history, I mean, basically since, gosh, Mikhail, the first Romanov czar, serfs have become more and more like slaves, less and less like independent citizens, right? So I think it's really important for you to understand that while the rest of Europe is modernizing so rapidly, in most of Russia, it's still like it was in the year 1600. So when serfdom is eliminated, you have 23 million serfs made legally free from their landlords. That means technically they are allowed to own property, marry by choice, trade freely, sue in the courts, vote in local elections, they're allowed to move around. Think about all the things I just listed. This, these were all new rights for them. But they also had these redemption payments. So serfs had to buy the land assigned to them. So essentially, they had been basically slaves on this land. Now, if they want to continue using this land and living on it, they have to pay for the privilege, right? They essentially become sharecroppers. You have the Zemetovs, Z-E-M-S-T-V-O-E-S. I definitely did not pronounce it correctly. These are local governments, and they regulated roads, schools, and policies for peasants. So the emancipation of serfs aided in changing Russia from a predominantly agricultural state to a slightly more industrialized one with a labor force. But this did not lead to increased agricultural productivity, right? Logically, it seems like, oh, great, now that they're industrializing more, they have more freedom, you should see an increase in agricultural production as fertilizers and tractors and combines start to diffuse outwards. Nope. Peasants are highly unskilled and still use outdated agricultural methods like hand tools and maybe an ox. So the emancipation of serfdom actually exacerbates the economic strains that um, Russia was experiencing. The emancipation of serfdom made life worse for most serfs. And Russian industrialization, relatively small. Right, The government supported industry, but the main source of income for Russia was the fact that they exported grain to Western Europe in exchange for some machinery. <clears throat> nope, we're not there yet. So, in the 1870s and 1880s, we will see that our biggest industrial change in Russia is going to be the building up of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. This will connect European Russia with the Pacific. In 1892 to 1903, you have Sergei Wheat, the Russian Minister of Finance, supervising economic industrialization in Russia. So you start to see in the late 19th century some factories springing up in Russian cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. You see some improved banking, high tariffs designed to improve or sorry to protect these young Russian industries, and an increase in steel production. But it's so limited. Your labor force is untrained. Your agricultural production is still 
several hundred years old. You have no middle class. And this is all state sponsored. You have no private industrialization, right? Which means that if the money is not coming from the state, it's not happening. We start to see a increase in public education though, but man, this isn't working. This industrialization is just not working. So you see increasing tensions in Russia. You see the pogroms, not pilgrims. This is mass persecution of Jews, which will lead to Jewish emigrants. We see frustrated peasants. We see businesses and professional people, as well as sort of the intelligentsia becoming active in demanding liberal reforms. But most Russian radicals are anarchists, right? It's going to be an anarchist who kills Alexander II. So in this time period, we see anarchists in general doing a lot of assassinations in Europe. So in the late 1870s, Alexander II begins to re uh, reverse his interest in reform. He is assassinated in 1881 by a member of the People's Will, which is a left-wing terrorist group. And our subsequent czars, Alexander III and Nicholas II, will oppose all political reform. Because in Russia, you have this weird idea of like sacred autocracy. It is God's will that these czars are in power. And to thus do anything that would cause them to give up some of their power, like having a constitutional monarchy, would mean that they are going against the will of God. So we have so much instability in Russia. Poland rebels. You have huge Jewish populations, but the government and most of those in power are super anti-Semitic. So you have massacres of Jewish populations, which act as a push factor. You see that there is an attempt to force Russian as a unifying language, which actually ends up being super divisive. And then you have the Russo-Japanese War. Russia is continuing to expand into the Middle East and Manchuria. This is spurred by a desire for tra traditional Russian expansionism and the need for a distraction from internal unrest. Japan becomes concerned about Russian power extending into Korea. So they go to war and they win easily. And they move into Korea instead. Russia is too slow. Their military is too cumbersome. You are really going to see this when we get to World War I of just how backwards Russia is. Okay, let's finish our day by talking about China. China is continuing to be in turmoil as well. So you have the first Sino-Japanese War, which is Qing China versus the Meiji Emperor over control of Japan, and China loses. Then you have the Boxer Rebellion. So <laughs> peasants create a society called the Righteous and Harmonious Fists, which sounds like an awesome like 80s hairband. And these peasants say that Look, it's the reason why China sucks right now is because of all of this foreign influence. It's because of Christians. It's because of the British. It's because of all these foreigners. And we need to push them all out. So some of these foreigners include the Qing, right, who are originally from Manchuria. So they want to destroy the Qing government and rid China of all foreign influences. Instead, what we see is the rest of the world, all those foreign powers, intervene and put down the rebellion. This leads to greater control of Chinese affairs because China couldn't deal with their own internal rebellion. So Europe intervenes. So China's inability to prevent Western encroachments is taking a toll on its sovereignty. But I think it's important to note that even though it seems so illogical to us, knowing the trajectory of history, 
we see that the Chinese elites are so anti-reform, so anti-change. In part, think about it. One of the things that industrialization does is it allows you to do more with less people, right? It's going to be useful for European countries, which have a smaller population. You don't need someone to do every single step of the work. Well, China kind of needs to keep all these people employed, right? Industrialization is actually more of a threat than a help. They also don't know kind of how to modernize without losing all of their Chinese identity. And the result is they lose all their Chinese identity, especially as Japan starts to invade and reach out in its own imperialistic way. So Yagamada Arimoto is one of the leaders of the Meiji Restoration. He wants to put Japan on the same level as the rest of Europe. He views Japan as being on the same level as the rest of Europe. I mean, look at his outfit. That could be any European military outfit. So an independent Japan has to create its own spheres of influence that include Korea, Manchuria, and China because no European countries can be allowed to control this territory. If they do, that will put them in too close of a proximity to Japan and thus be a threat. So he builds up Japanese, Japan's military and conquers Korea, Taiwan, and southern Manchuria. So in uh, one of many conflicts between Japan and China, Japan's winning every day of the week. So fears about the West and belief about international power politics will influence Meiji imperialistic policies. But we see it's expanding, right? You have the Sino-Japanese War, Japan wins, and now they have access to all that raw material in Korea. In 1902, they ally with Britain. In 1904, they win the Russo-Japanese War. They see themselves as a major Pacific power, and their economic success in production and industry boosts their political confidence. I encourage you to read about what they did in Japan because it's awful. I think it's easy to do a couple things. One, glorify war and say, like, no one did anything bad. Two, only acknowledge that some countries did bad things. Oh, only the Americas committed, uh, only like the United States committed genocide of Native peoples. Nope, Argentina and Chile did too. Or only the Soviets committed war crimes in World War II. No, the Americans did as well, and so did the Japanese. I encourage you to read about the Japanese comfort women. We'll talk more about it as we get into the 20th century. But with this, we see the fall of the Qing Empire, right? This dynastic cycle that has been in place for literally thousands of years ends in 1912. The Taiping Rebellion and the Boxer Rebellion mark the end. Plus, they act as huge push factors for many Chinese citizens to leave China and migrate to the Americas. We see an increase in underground secret societies. We see basically non-stop revolts against the Qing government. And often, these resistance groups are led by young men who had received Western educations. In 1905, civil service exams are over. Like, remember when we first introduced those? It's an end of an age. And then the Republican Revolution will topple the Qing dynasty. So, in conclusion, industrialization is going to combine, sorry, industrialization combined with the introduction of electricity, steel, new chemicals like medicine, aspirin, global communication will serve to increase the economic power of the West and Japan. Problems of pollution are going to continue, and we see that women are starting to enter factories and more of a demand for women's rights will emerge. We see that socialism becomes an intellectual movement 
labor unions are gaining recognition, and universal male suffrage will become the law in the United States and parts of Europe. Conservatives will use nationalism to unify nations such as Germany and Italy, whereas the Meiji Restoration will give regained power to the emperor. And the number of great powers in the world expands to include Germany, Japan, and the United States as we close out the 19th century. For our next lesson, guys, we'll start talking about the road to war with World War I. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, let me know. I encourage you to check out the other videos in our Unit 7 video playlist to learn more about all of this.